A catastrophic situation in Syria's most embattled city. Airstrikes continue in Aleppo, shattering what's left of a fragile ceasefire between the government and opposition fighters. Are Assad's forces gearing up for an all-out assault on the city? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. It's already one of the most devastated cities in Syria, but Aleppo has seen a dramatic escalation of fighting over the past few days. There have been a series of airstrikes which have killed at least 200 people this week alone. Activists say the Syrian government has launched at least 20 airstrikes since Wednesday, which have hit two hospitals in Aleppo. Syrian state television reported rebels also attacked a mosque in a government-held part of the city, killing at least 15 people. And the war is nowhere nearer to the end. Talks in Switzerland are stalled, government troops are gathering around the city, and aid agencies warning Aleppo's on the brink of a humanitarian disaster. Let's get straight into the discussion then and bring in our guests. Joining us from Washington, D.C. is Ubay Shabanda, a senior communications advisor with Corvus MSL Group. In Lancaster, Simon Mabon, lecturer in international relations and government at Lancaster University. And in Moscow, Vladimir Mikhaev, independent analyst with the Troika Report Project. Welcome to you all. If I could start with Ubay, why has such a fierce offensive against Aleppo been launched now? Well, <clears throat> the cessation of hostilities has been steadily fraying in the, for the past month, actually. We've seen reports from uh, human rights uh, watchers and from Doctors Without Borders on the ground that since the past month, we've seen a steady escalation of systemic, systemic airstrikes targeting hospitals, targeting uh, Syrian civil defense um, facilities, targeting um, ambulance centers, and we've only seen this, uh, this es escalation climax in the past couple of days as Russian forces, Russian aircraft, and the Assad regime forces and their affiliated militias gear up for an all-out assault against Aleppo. Um, but, but, oh, wait, this is more than just such a, a, you mentioned there we've seen a gradual fraying. This is more than a gradual fraying. What we've seen in the is, past 48 more than hours, a gradual fraying. And, it, according absolutely. to Demastura, the, is an average of one Syrian civilian killed every 25 minutes, he says. And this is very purposeful, and this, has been, this is very clearly pre-planned and systemic. And what we're seeing here is the culmination of a plan by the Assad regime and the Russian Air Force to steadily destroy any um, aspects of civil society and medical centers in northern Syria and in rebel-held territory. We saw uh, yesterday the destruction of the Al-Quds Hospital, the only pediatric and emergency center facility in Aleppo. We've seen the destruction previously um, uh, two days before that in Marat Noman in Idlib in northwest Syria, destruction of hospital centers, uh, hospitals run by doctors without borders. Uh, that's why we're seeing this, these horrific strikes are really climaxing to, to an extent that very clearly the Assad regime and its, and its Russian-backed forces are gearing up for an all-out assault, and we are seeing okay. an unprecedented level of slaughter. Let me bring Vladimir in, and um, no doubt you have a perspective on this. Are we seeing Assad forces backed by the Russians deciding, as Obey was describing there, to simply destroy Aleppo and destroy its infrastructure? Is that the plan? Well, uh, there are two things I should mention. First of all, uh, according to the statement by the Russian Minister of Defense, and they said it very loud and clear, uh, that the Russian airplanes have not made any sorties in the several last days. So the Russian Air Force is not part of this military campaign. Second, as you said, what were, I don't think that uh, the emboldened regime of Bashar Assad is actually uh, trying to destroy completely Aleppo. Whether the, I don't think that he has the definite intention to destroy uh, civilian targets, especially hospitals, quite knowing that it would create an outrage. I don't think that the regime of Bashar Assad is as barbaric and appalling, despite many facts to the contrary, that he actually purposely right now started destroying, uh, what as I said, hospitals and killing people knowing that he's well watched by the international community and by everyone else, including uh, the uh, anti-Assad uh, Syrian uh, opposition. 
All right, I could see Obey shaking his head. He wants to come back in on on this. So uh, come back in, Obey. Look, this is, this is, these aren't my words. Physicians for Human Rights and Doctors Without Borders very clearly indicated that these airstrikes against these hospitals and these pediatric centers are not only systemic, but they are multi we're seeing multiple strikes against the same hospital, multiple accurate strikes by the same hospital. Areas and hospitals and, and physician centers and ambulance centers that the Russian Air Force and their, um, and their special forces on the ground that direct these airstrikes are, know are very well marked. This is a part of a systemic campaign by the Assad regime to destroy all civil institutions and medical centers to, in, in rebel-held territory to create this hell on earth so that the Assad regime can go back to the international community and say, I am the only solution. And the Russian uh, regime is cynically backing him in this effort. Uh, Simon here, the, the situation thus far, uh, the Syrian regime is saying, we're not carrying out airstrikes. Uh, the Russian defense ministry said, we haven't carried out any airstrikes. Clearly somebody must be carrying out a lot of airstrikes. It, it seems difficult to believe the rebels are carrying out airstrikes. They don't have that kind of capability on yeah. their own city. What is going on? Well, I think the answer lies somewhere between the two or the guests that you've got on. I think it's pretty clear that the people carrying out the airstrikes are the forces of Bashar al-Assad and probably uh, Russian planes as well. Now, whether this is an attempt to destroy the whole of Aleppo, I, I find difficult to believe. I think it's, it's clearly an attempt to destroy certain parts of Aleppo, but let's not forget that, that there are also uh, pro-regime supporters in Aleppo, and that Aleppo was uh, hugely important. It was one of the largest cities in Syria. It was a big industrial and, and, and vibrant metropolis and so any attempts to destroy this seem a little counterintuitive now I, I do believe that the argument that the, with the breakdown of talks there's a real sense of breakdown in trust diplomatically and also on the ground and with this rising chaos with the the increasing chaos and complexity of everything that's going on across Syria uh, the, the, the regime of Bashar al-Assad will want to go back to the international community and say within this chasm, within all of this chaos, I am the only one that can prevent the emergence of, uh, of organizations such as Daesh and that it ultimately is me that has to maintain control. But okay. if we look at the death toll, if we look at the data, we see that it's Bashar al-Assad and his forces that's responsible for a, a huge percentage. We're talking 90% upwards of the civilian casualties in Syria. Okay, let me uh, bring Vladimir back into the discussion. We'll talk about the other angles which Simon opened there in a moment, but what will the Russian position be then if uh, the Russian official position is they are not participating in these airstrikes against Aleppo? Will Russia push the Assad regime to stop the assault that's going on as the US is urging Moscow to do, the State Department saying you know, Russia's got its influence and should pressure Bashar al-Assad's government to stop these attacks? Well, first of all, definitely, Russia is very much unhappy about the fact that the civilians, non-combatants, uh, are being targeted in this respect and are falling victims to this civil war in, in Syria, which is going on for four years. And I don't think that is the only instance uh, when uh, people uh, or not directly involved in the battlefield and the battlefield have been uh, killed. Second, I think there is a certain mis um, over exaggeration over the extent that Moscow has influence, as you have said it, over Bashar Assad. I think it would be more appropriate if, if, if in the United States, for instance, uh, since it was. Hasn't John the Kerry Russian intervention here, turned Moscow the tide for the restrained? Bashar al Assad regime, Vladimir? No, no, no. Uh, listen, it's, it's no influence that to that extent that you, that you believe. I think it would be more appropriate for the United States to talk to those who actually have more control and more influence with Damascus. And these people are in Tehran. If they want to influence the course of events, they should talk to the leadership of, the, of Iran. They, they have been supporting Bashar Assad all through these four years. It's not the Russia that actually stepped into the game only in October last year. but. Tehran, who has real influence, and especially within the concept that they have been pursuing of creating the Shiite Christian. So if someone wants to have control over Bashar Assad, I think you'd better find these people in Iran and not in Russia. All right, Vladimir Obey doesn't seem to think that the Russians are the key factor with, with influence in this. All right, Simon, I can see what wants to go ahead, Simon. Yeah. 
I, I think there are two points that, that we need to take into account. First of all, it's a five year long civil war and that extra year has resulted in hundreds of thousands of deaths. Now, I, I think you're right to point out that Tehran has a great deal of influence, but there were two points in this conflict where the regime of Bashar al-Assad was about to fall. Now, the first one was when Ira Iranian special forces, the Revolutionary Guard stepped in and propped up uh, Bashar al-Assad. The second one was when Russia got increasingly involved. Now, I think it's fair to say that both Moscow and Tehran exercise a great deal of influence, if not control, over Bashar al-Assad. And I think that the onus must be on a range of external actors, Russia, Iran and the US to put pressure on on any kind of actors that have influence in this conflict. Well, and, Simon, clearly they don't seem to be doing that. Do you think that allies? does that does that indicate to you that perhaps there has been a decision on the part of the Syrian regime and its uh, foreign backers to try and resolve this problem, this revolution, this crisis militarily? Well, if we look at what Bashar al-Assad has been saying for the, well, for the past few months in particular, he's been saying that he's going to retake all of Syria. Now, this was met with some, some concern uh, by a number of people in Moscow saying, we don't really want you to do that. So I'm, I'm a little bit confused as to what's actually going on, because it seems that in light of recent events, that's exactly what Assad's pushing for. He's sensed an opportunity, he's sensed a weakness in the international community and an opportunity to win Syria back and demonstrate to a range of external actors that, look, I am the only person that can bring any semblance of order to this chaos. And this chaos has resulted in the emergence of international organizations like Daesh that pose a threat to the West. If you want to crush Daesh, then you need me in charge. And I think that's the message Assad's putting out. Ultimately, though, I think a range of other actors need to have very, very strong words with a range of different actors. It's not just about those involved in Syria, unfortunately, because of the internationalization of this conflict and because of the other actors that are involved, both in Geneva and in supporting the range of actors that are operating in Syria. Right. There are other people that are complicit in what's happening. There's a lot of people involved in Syria, no doubt. Do you think, Obey, that the opposition can be defeated militarily? Will Aleppo fall? And what would that mean for the rebellion against Bashar al-Assad? I think that the <clears throat> Assad regime and his Alawite militias, as well as the Iranian Revolutionary Guard forces in Aleppo, believe that they can retake Aleppo militarily. It's definitely going to be a very difficult fight. But let's also look at some of the details and specifics on the ground in terms of developments in the past 48 hours in northern Syria, as this so-called ceasefire has almost more, you know, more or less completely collapsed. Russian fingerprints are all over the slaughter that we've seen in the past two days where over 100 civilians, dozens of nurses, medical staff members and doctors have been slaughtered both in Aleppo and in Idlib province. How so? Obey? Imagine Vladimir would say Russian. that's these not are, true are and, and the Russians these, are upset are, about the is, loss of civilian lives. absolutely life. true. That, that is a mealy-mouthed reply by our, by our friend in Moscow. We're looking at Russian, Russian munitions that have been replenished, replenished replenishing Assad regime warplanes. We're looking at Russian Spetsnaz forces on the ground that are carrying out, that are tar uh, laser targeting uh, targets. They know they are, we're looking at Russian um, colonels and officers in the operations rooms with the Assad regime that are, perp that are carrying out these targeting packages. The Russians know every single sortie that the Assad regime is launching beforehand and they clear it. We saw that in Idlib province where the Russian Ministry of Defense declared an area that was Al-Qaeda. What did we see instead? We saw uh, regime and Russian aircraft targeting an, a, an open air market leading to the slaughter of 50 civilians as they went to gather their groceries. They're using the same strategy in Aleppo today. They are shaping the ground in, in preparation for a massive strike and a massive offensive on the ground by the Assad regime. We've seen hundreds killed in the past 48 hours, and we fear that thousands more will be killed if the international community does not step in and hold Moscow and Tehran, as well as the uh, regime in Damascus, accountable. Let's take that point to Moscow then. Uh, Vladimir, the Russian forces have been accused of 150 violations of the ceasefire lately, according to figures I looked up. Uh, has Russia decided, has Moscow decided, that there's no hope anymore in these peace talks, that they want to back the Assad regime in a military solution to this conflict? I would certainly disagree with most of the fantasies that have been spoken by the previous orator. And as for your assumption that Moscow has actually backing the military solution to it, it also doesn't fit bode well with the facts. Quite on the contrary, 
Moscow is very strongly supporting the idea of an inter-Syrian dialogue. And this is why it actually has managed to bring to the point uh, when the opposition and the Syrian government have actually sat at the negotiation table and started at least talking instead of shooting at each other, which has actually lasted for almost four years. To a great extent, both the Syrian opposition and Bashar Assad's regime owe to Russia and to Moscow diplomatic efforts that they were able to start talking to each other about what will be the post-war Syria. And this is actually something that has been very uh, key to, the, to, to certain success uh, in terms, let's say, of Russia establishing itself as a mediator in this uh, awful, appalling civil war that has been started four years ago with the sponsorship of so many regional and extra regional sponsors that have been providing money, armaments and support to the Syrian opposition in order to topple the government in Damascus, which, according to the international law, is still as a, the only legitimate government in this place. If there is any cast to be blamed on who is backing the, the regime and who is backing the armed forces on the ground that are creating the chaos today, there are two places that we are look at, and it is Moscow and Tehran. The Russians are not coming in as goodwill, um, as goodwill mediators for a peace process. The Assad regime clearly had a, a choice to make when they went to Geneva to accept a transitional governing body and to accept a transition away from Bashar al-Assad as a pathway to peace and they rejected it as clearly the okay. Russians did because they continuously publicly and privately back the Assad regime. So this hypocrisy that we're seeing from Moscow is incredible and contemptible as we see hundreds of people being killed today in Aleppo right. and oh. northwest Syria by Russian bombs. All right, Obey, let me, let me just jump in here. Vladimir, I think the question is, has Russia now seen as the peace talks falter and not lead anywhere. My question was, what do you make of suggestions that the Russians have decided to back a military solution? That the, Has a decision in fact been taken, do you think, in Moscow that this can't be solved diplomatically, you might as well try and finish it militarily? Once again I say, on the contrary, Russia is still, once say, if it actually believed in having a military solution, it would have not withdrawn most of its air forces and other uh, military personnel uh, from Syria. Now it has been limited to a very right. small force. Uh, if, 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 if Russia actually believed that, it has, uh, that the Syrian civil war has a military solution, it would have acted differently. Okay. On the contrary, it has been pressuring Bashar Assad on many insistently in order for him to accept the very idea that the inter-Syrian government that and the, the idea of a government of national reconciliation is the only solution to this uh, right, long me, uh, term uh, and other Let me bring in crisis. Simon Mabin here. What about those who are backing the opposition, yeah, the United the States, the Gulf? All right, go ahead. It is Moscow that weak that it is unable to persuade the regime of Bashar al-Assad, a regime that is losing legitimacy incredibly quickly, that is facing a civil war to, uh, <laughs> to not to not continue with this uh, military action and to, to have diplomatic relations and to have a diplomatic discussion. It seems bonkers that, that Moscow isn't strong enough to persuade Bashar al-Assad to do this. Well, maybe, I, maybe you are right. I think I would agree, uh, I would agree that uh, if you, if you uh, oversimplify this, uh, let's say, Syrian equation and believe that it all boils down to the patron-client relationship, then you must be very naive. Uh, Bashar Assad is, uh, I would say, is a very tough cookie, and he's, uh, he has been long around, and he knows how to handle things. If you think that Moscow is in some way trying to uh, influence him and treat him as a puppet, now you must be naive. Definitely not. Uh, Mo Moscow is just one of the elements in a wider, let's say, geopolitical uh, situation with too many factors in play. Right. And if you believe that if there is someone who can actually uh, force uh, or uh, influence, persuade and convince Bashar Assad, then definitely you should try to find these people not in Moscow. Uh, all right. So let's bring in uh, Obey into the discussion, talking about the other geopolitical actors, the U.S., the Gulf states, Turkey. What about those parties which are backing the opposition and they're watching what's happening in Aleppo? Do you think it'll prompt a stronger intervention on their part? Well, we saw Arab allies like Saudi Arabia, U the UAE and other Gulf countries backing the Syrian opposition uh, to go to Geneva 
to initiate this peace process and to sit at the same table with representatives of the Assad regime as part of a process to establish a transition away from Bashar al-Assad. Uh, and yet, we are, as we, we saw in the past uh, few days, in the past week, that this, this cessation of hostilities and the negotiations have all more or less collapsed because of the ongoing assaults by the Assad regime and his Russian backers. Now, does this mean that we will see a response by the backers of the opposition? I think you absolutely, uh, that the Syrian opposition has every right to defend the Syrian populace. Um, I think you're going to see an enhanced operational tempo by the backers of the Syrian opposition to provide them with the necessary tools to protect themselves. See, uh, hang on a bit. You don't agree with those onslaught. analysts who, who are saying that some of the backers, perhaps the United States, for example, these analysts say, want to see the rebels, the rebel position, quote unquote, soften so that they will accept a future role for Bashar al-Assad mm. in a future Syria. Um, do you agree with that? Mm. I, w I would disagree with that. Uh, we saw both uh, the military and political representatives of the Syrian opposition agree to, uh, to go to Geneva and to initiate the, the, the discussions and the negotiations with the Assad regime. Uh, the question is, does the Syrian opposition, will the Syrian opposition receive the same type of leverage and support by its international backers and its friends as the Assad regime is receiving from Russia? Every single week we are seeing more Ilyushin aircraft flying from Russia through Iranian airspace, through Iraqi airspace, into Damascus airport or into Latakia airport to offload its deadly cargo uh, on behalf of the Assad regime and its militias. Th those are the facts on the ground. Whether or not the Syrian opposition's backers will respond in kind, I think uh, time will tell as the, as this, uh, as the fighting uh, escalates. Simon, if they don't, where does this leave ISIL, Nusra Front? And uh, the ability of Bashar al-Assad to present himself, as you were saying, as the, the only credible force to be counted on. Well, I think what you see is that the Syrian people are being squeezed by a whole host of in, uh, infinitely more powerful actors. You'll see uh, more displacements and more deaths. You'll see Assad trying to, to make the claim that he's the only way of, of getting out of this mess with... Uh, uh, without terrorist groups like Daesh, like Jabhat al-Nusra gaining ground. But ultimately, you'll see people that are being squeezed. You'll see people that are being barrel bombed by, uh, by the government, their own government. And I take issue with the notion that, that Assad is the legitimate ruler of, of a state when he is barrel bombing his own population. At one point, certainly he was the legitimate ruler. As soon as he started killing his own population, he, he negates that right to be called a legitimate ruler of a state. Now, when people are, are fearing for their lives, they're struggling to feed themselves, they're struggling to protect themselves and their families, they will turn elsewhere to make sure that their security needs, their basic human needs, food, safety, security, health, are being met. Ultimately, that will mean people turn elsewhere to groups that are, that are violent, that have different types of ideologies, many of whom we might not necessarily agree with. And as a consequence, the continuation of these hostilities, the, the increasing violence, will only drive people into organizations like Daesh and Jabhat al-Nusra. This conflict has to stop now. It is in its sixth year. It is abhorrent. The international community has got to do more and more to stop more people dying and millions of people from being displaced. All right, I'm afraid we are out of time. It is a hot topic, and uh, no doubt we will continue to discuss it in future shows. But for now, uh, let's thank our guests for what's been a, it's been a lively discussion of Ay Shabanda, Simon Mabon, and Vladimir Mikhaev. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the show again anytime if you head over to our website. And for further discussion, just head over to the Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there, at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and on behalf of the whole team here for now, it's goodbye. <laughs>